Amen. As Chad, you can have a seat. As Chad just mentioned, uh, we are going to rearrange the typical order for the way we often do things here. Um, we don't have a, a lot of tradition, um, but just as any uh, group that gathers together on a regular basis, you do get turn, tend to get into a uh, um, some uh, typical ways of doing things, and we, you know, we way we do things is typically we'll have about a half an hour, forty minutes of of worship and song, and then teaching of the Word, and then response and communion. Um, but today we're going to have the teaching up to the front. And so what I'm going to do right now is go ahead and um, usually during the teaching we give opportunity for children to go into classes that are more, that would provide teaching of the gospel that, that they can, that's more uh, easily understood on, on their level. But we also invite you to leave your kids in here if you want them to stay with you. And so right now you could do that. My wife April is right here in the aisle and she is going to lead them to their places. And additionally, um, we're gonna remind you of this at the end of the service today that, um, by way of announcement, but there is gonna be a clipboard being passed around and if that comes to you, if it doesn't come to you, it will be out here on the table later or maybe we'll put it up here on the stage or something, but that is for next uh, Saturday, our uh, church-wide, um, it's also open to anybody you wanna bring with you, um, party that we just fall party. This fall weather is awesome. We love, we get, we rent out the church camp that's down in um, is, it act, is that, act, that is Meg's County, isn't it? It's right on the edge of the line between Meg's and Athens, right at the same exit as the Fur Peace Ranch there. There's a church camp right before you get to the Fur Peace Ranch. And it's the Ohio Valley Christian Assembly. Um, they have a great campfire, great area for us to um, just really uh, you know, eat food and spend time together and just really have a great time. And so that's for that. And uh, we've started a sign-up sheet for um, to get an idea of what people would like to bring and everything's categorized and if you're coming and you'd like to bring something by all means participate and uh, if you just want to come if you if you say I, I at this time in life I can't bring anything but I just I still want to come by all means come and, and fellowship with us so um, all right we're here and uh, we're, we, we've mixed things up, so that, that often will cause people to, to, to perk up. Why are we doing this? Uh, one of the reasons why we're doing this is because I have a lot that I want to say today. And uh, um, I'm not going to talk until 12 o'clock, so you don't have to worry about that. But particularly, um, not only do I have a lot to say, but I have some, some weighty things that I want to talk about, some heavy things that I think would be, it would be beneficial for us to have a little more time at the end of our gathering together today to ponder and contemplate uh, the, the word of the Lord today um, and to be able to pray and just seek um, the Holy Spirit's extended guidance um, to each of us personally um, at the end. And so that's what we're going to do. And so what we typically do at the, at the end of the teaching time is we have a time of worship, but often that's one or two songs. Today it's going to be more than that. It's going to be an extended time of worship. And so at any time during that time of worship, we invite, we have, you notice we have communion up here on both sides of the stage. We invite anyone who is a Christian, it means you're a member of the, the universal church of Christ, uh, the, of Christ's body. We invite you to participate with all of those here that are also members here in communion with us. And you can, you're freely welcome to participate in the remembrance of, of the, the very reason why we gather together, which is to celebrate the fact that we have received redemption. We have received forgiveness and grace through the, G through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. We now have fellowship with God. And so we celebrate that together um, through taking of bread and juice. And then members of this church bring offerings during that time. And if you're not a member of this church, don't bring an offering. Um, I'll just say it that way. So um, if you really want to, you can, but, but um, that's not something that we um, pressure you to do. Um, perhaps You've made every attempt uh, to crawl into a cave in the last six months or so and try to ignore the political landscape in our country. Um, but you've likely found, just like I have, that that is impossible. It is absolutely impossible. Without a doubt, one of the greatest concerns among every person living in this nation and actually around the world and, um, and especially among Christians in the United States today is who are we going to vote for for president? Who am I going to vote for? Um, and maybe some Christians are frustrated that God hasn't lined up the candidates that they had hoped for. And so we're now left with basically evil versus evil, and we have to choose the lesser of the two. Um, some people are laughing at our nation. 
and uh, wondering, wow, is this the best America has to offer? And, and, and knowing that, that talking politics has the potential to cause such a firestorm in the church, I've thought about just avoiding this topic altogether, and I've really tried in my own heart of hearts, in my own mind and preparation, to just try to avoid it. But this week, I, I, I became really convicted with the notion that as a, as a leader and a pastor and a shepherd of people, it is my role and responsibility to help you wade through this mess. You shouldn't have to wander alone. I understand that and uh, with no guiding principles from your church family. And so this morning, by God's grace and uh, asking for His grace, we're going to talk about the presidential election and the sovereignty of God. Let's pray before we do that, okay? Father, I ask for, um, for Your grace um, I ask for your presence right now. We know that um, we don't need to ask for that because wherever two or more are gathered, there you are, and we're here in your name this morning too, to celebrate you and to hear from you, to glorify you. And so my prayer this morning, Lord, is that the words that are spoken here in the next 40 minutes or so will glorify you. They won't glorify me or any other person here or any person in this nation, uh, around this world, any human that's been created, but these words would glorify you and you alone because that's why we're here. And I pray that you would help me to not be seen or noticed this morning. I pray that you would just be a conduit, that I would be a conduit for the Holy Spirit to speak. That's my sole prayer and purpose here today in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wanna give you a hypothetical scenario. Suppose we, uh, and this is, you're going to have to use your imagination, all right? Suppose we heard that the entire election was going to be completely called off. And, and not just the entire election, but the whole idea of election, the whole process forever. It's called off. No more candidates ever. No more rallies. No more campaign speeches. No more debates, thank goodness. No more public vote whatsoever. And instead, instead of all of that, God himself would choose the next president of the United States. <laughs> I, we may get several amens this morning. That's good. That's good. Uh, that'd be amazing, right? It'd be an amen moment. It'd be awesome. No more worries. God's going to choose the correct person for the job. He'll choose the best person for the job. We know that. But hang on a second. <laughs> what is one of the the basic fundamental biblical truths that we have tried to always stand on and bring to you in this church. Those of you who have been here for a while, what is one of the basic fundamental truths that we cling to? That He is sovereign. That God is in control. So wouldn't that mean that He already is in complete control of the upcoming election? Doesn't that, isn't that what it means? Isn't he already involved in the process? Isn't that what it means to be sovereign? I mean, and so in the end, won't, won't God be the one who actually does choose our next president? Check yourself. What do you, what do you believe about what sovereignty means? I mean, you know, to define sovereignty, the word sovereignty, just very basic, the definition of it is the, uh, the quality or state of being sovereign or specifically having supreme power and authority. So as you look at the Bible, and you look in the Bible, the way the Bible refers to God's sovereignty or the God being sovereign, and the way you see this is through every event and story and everything that takes place throughout the history of the, of the Bible, of the creation. When the Bible is referring to God's sovereignty, it's referring to God's absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. That's what it means to have a sovereign God. And so if you believe that God is sovereign, that, that his, his nature as creator God makes him sovereign over the creation he has made, then the very concept of your belief, the, very, the, the foundation of your belief suggests that God's knowledge is of all the events that are going to take place in the world before they occur, that he has foreknowledge of that. 
I'll give you some references in case you're taking notes. I, I, I'm not going to... I'm not going to quote every verse that I, that I refer to today, but I will give you references so that you can look them up. But I am going to quote several verses, but I, I don't have time to quote them all. And so I'll say 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 is one to write down. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 is another to write down, which talks about we know from the Scripture that God does know. He, under, he knows what's going to happen before it takes place. And that's part of what it means to be sovereign. Well, if you, also, if you believe God is sovereign, then you also believe that God has divine choice to elect a people for himself and for his purposes, and you believe in his ability to bring to pass the things that he has determined beforehand would occur. See Ephesians 1, 5, and we will quote that later. But what, what, what I'm saying is that God being sovereign, if we truly serve a sovereign God as the Bible teaches we do, then that means that not only does God know who's going to be president or know who's, what's going to happen in the future, not only does he look out there and see what's taking place, but God also ordains it to happen, either by, permiss- by his permission, by permitting those things to take place by the choices of men and women, or by absolutely actively making them happen. And you see both of those things taking place throughout history. You see events in the world where things take place, and then later, hundreds of years later, you see, oh, wow, it's amazing that God, it's obvious now to see that God did this. And that's one of the things, that's actually one of the reasons why we are, I, I went this direction this morning, is because my original intent this week, I was going to begin preaching on the Old Testament, and uh, I specifically wanted to do some sermons through Deuteronomy and First and Second Kings. I've seen a, a, a lot of your feedback about wanting to hear from, from uh, some words uh, from those books. And so, um, as I was looking at those books specifically, I thought to myself, well, you know what, we need to back up a step and take a look at the entire, maybe do an entire survey of the history of the world, of the Old Testament, of all the Old Testament, and just see how things took place in, 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 you know, in chronology so that we can then go to the book of Deuteronomy and go to the book of First and Second Kings and talk about those events specifically in those books. And it was amazing as I began to do that, own, that study on all of those little things that took place and all those people that God put into power and then removed from power and this event that God caused to happen and then this event and how this event caused his plan and purpose to take place later and this event caused his plan. And you step back and you see the big picture where you basically get a a God's perspective. That's what we have when you have the Bible. God is giving you his perspective of what he has done in the world. And for us to sit right here in this little finite 70, 80 years that you're going to live and assume that you know everything there is to know right now is ludicrous. It's ludicrous. And so I sat and I thought, you know what? Let's, let's, let's talk about this. Because this is one of the most polarizing moments in the life of not only our country, the church as a whole, Christianity, probably your friendships. You've had conversations and people that you try to avoid conversations with because you know it's going to come up. And so hopefully this morning we can, we can fulfill our role to, to pastor you well in this. John Calvin said that the sovereignty of God points to the idea that all events whatsoever are governed by the secret counsel of God. So of course one of the biggest questions that always comes up in light of talking about the sovereignty of God is the place of human responsibility. And so we're going to talk about both of those things this morning, particularly in the context of the presidential election, which is on the forefront of our minds. One of the questions that might surface from this topic is when people choose, you know, when people vote to choose their leaders in an election, is the outcome a function of human choice or divine sovereignty? It's a great question. It's a great question. You know, national election is the process that's been adopted by most nations in the world to seek their lead, to select their leaders. And that's obviously what we have in the United States. But the question we probably all wrestle with is, those who are Christians, those who believe in the sovereignty of God is, does God play any role? I mean, does God, is God really playing any role in this arrangement? I mean, especially when you consider the candidates in today's race for the president. How could God possibly be involved in this? Some of you may be wondering that. How could he possibly be involved in this? Well, in in cooperation with the sovereignty of God, the Bible also teaches 
that human beings, you and me, the, the create, you know, those who have been created by God, we have responsibility and freedom of choice that individually we can make choice. Now, I want you to notice that I said in cooperation with the, so the sovereignty of God. This is not a juxtaposition. I'm not going to contrast the two because some, in some mysterious, amazing way, these two things do fit together. And that's the beauty of it. You have choices that you have made, and you've made them freely. I mean, you, you made your own decisions this morning about whether or not you would roll out of bed or hit the snooze button. Nobody forced you to do that. No one was there taking your hand and saying, hit the snooze, or get yourself, a, I mean, maybe, maybe somebody was getting, kicking you out of bed, but you made your own choice. You made, your, you made the decision of what you would wear today. You made your own decisions of how many cups of coffee you would have. You made your own choice of having that third no-bake cookie, right? We've... You, you, you make choices, and you know you do. And so it's, it's hard for us to sometimes think about absolute sovereignty and control when I know that I am choosing things freely. And I want to tell you, the reason why you have those choices is because according to you know, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, you were made in the image of God. And that word image can also be translated likeness which means that there are, there's a similarity there, that it conveys the idea of being similar to, which means that there are some attributes that you have. This is amazing. Think about the grace of God in doing this. There are some attributes that you have that God has decided that He would give you, such as decision-making, and He gave them to you because He made you in His image. Therefore, that is a huge responsibility because every decision we make we are to make them to honor God. We are to be God-honoring in every decision you make, every choice you make. And we ought to think that way. You mean about what I should wear? Yeah, we ought to think that way. About the third no-bake? Yes, ask Him about everything. Be mindful of God in everything you do. That's what it means to be God-honoring. And so as far as national elections are concerned, we exercise this power, of this, this attribute of power of making decisions by selecting candidates to vote for. Nevertheless, the Bible also clearly teaches how the choices and actions of human men and women result in the fulfillment of the will and purposes of God, thereby demonstrating His sovereignty in all the affairs of men and women. The Old Testament is full of these kinds of historical evidences of this, these, these events that took place. One of the stories that I looked at this week was the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And really, you look at King, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, it, it, this clearly points to the sovereignty of God in the affairs of men. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and after being restored to the throne, after a series of events, he, he loses his senses and pretty much becomes like a wild animal for seven years. And then he declares this in Daniel 4, 34 and 35. This is Nebuchadnezzar. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now concerning the revelation of what was going to come to the king, Daniel, the prophet, said this previous to Nebuchadnezzar's words in Daniel 4.17. This is what Daniel said concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He said, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom He will and sets over it the lowliest of men. You know, another example of the sovereign reign of God in the political realm, in the political matters of the history of the world, is, is how He caused the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus Christ would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. In Micah 5.2, it says that the, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And through the enactment of a decree by Augustus Caesar for a census, it was this decree by a secular, godless monarch 
that compelled Joseph to take his pregnant wife Mary from Galilee where they lived to to Bethlehem in Judea where Jesus was born according to the will of God. And that story is found in Luke 2 that we're probably more familiar with because we hear it every Christmas. So when you read the Bible, it's, it's, it's truly amazing. When you read the Bible, the only conclusion you can come to is that the Lord God is sovereign and he steers the affairs of men to accomplish his own purposes. The reason I say step back for a moment, I mean, that's the reason why we're not just jumping in and looking at a singular story in Deuteronomy and then another individual story in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. It's because we need to step back and see it's so easy to sit in a moment and say, what is happening in this moment suggests that God has left us, that God has no control over what's taking place, that God is not concerned. God could not possibly put this person into power. God could not possibly use this person. But when you step back and you look from Genesis to Revelation, you see story after story of this corrupt, evil, person that God has risen to power and said, I'm going to use you to do this and it's going to accomplish my will. And the people living in that day during that time are going, what on earth is God doing? And yet God is in control. And sometimes it takes incredible, always, not sometimes, always, it takes incredible faith to be able just to declare that. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, we don't often have, I mean, we we rarely have the understanding, the explanation for what he's doing. We rarely have the understanding or the capacity to reason why he often does what he does and how he is going to use certain events to accomplish his will. But hear this now, our limited understanding, our doubt, our complete obliviousness does not remove the reality of his sovereignty. He is sovereign. Whether you understand what's going on or not, whether you even agree with it or not, He is. A.W. Pink has said that the divine, divine sovereignty means that God is God in fact as well as in name. That He is on the throne of the universe, directing all things, working all things, as Ephesians 1.11 says, after the counsel of His own will. Job 42, 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Psalm 135, 6, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. 2 Kings 19, 25, have you not heard that I determined it long ago? This is God speaking. I planned from days of old what I now bring to pass. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I shall accomplish all my purpose. This is the God that we serve. This is not just some little small thing. This is not just some little thing that has taken place in our generation alone and then, and then it's, it's, it's over. This is the sovereign God of the universe who is in control of everything from beginning to end. That's what I'm concerning myself with during this election. And it's what we should be concerning ourselves with every day of our lives. Isaiah 43, 13, I am God. Also henceforth, I am He. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Who can hinder it? You know, of course, the Bible doesn't, I mean, we're still thinking, well, how does this, how can we apply this to, I mean, the Bible doesn't have democratic elections like we have them today because the monarch, the, you know, the monarchical nature of the government and governmental authority in that time. Uh, however, it is full of examples about the, the choice of leaders and the view that Christians should hold toward established governments. The Apostle Paul um, teaches again and again how that the human government, the government that we live under, is is instituted by God. He actually says that. And that no government exists apart from his will. Romans 13, the first two verses in Romans 13, verse 1 and 2 say this. This is the Apostle Paul. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. 
Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, you know, you hear that, we read that today, and we think, well, but Apostle Paul, you don't understand. This is, I mean, look at our candidates, the Apostle Paul. I mean, we, we look at what we have here. We, look, at how hor- look at how corrupt this is. Look at how horrible this is. Look at how, how immoral and, ungodly, and, and godless this is. You know, well, I, we don't overlook the fact that Paul wrote these words about being subject to human governments when the, the infamous Nero was emperor. Now, those were some of the darkest of all days for Christians who suffered enormous persecution and death at Nero's hand. And yet that persecution of the early church served the purposes of God in spreading the Christian faith rapidly around the world. And so I I can imagine that for as much as you and I want to say, but you don't understand, Apostle Paul, that when the Roman Christians read this, they probably said, but you don't understand, Apostle Paul. Yeah, he did understand because he had a view of faith, of the sovereign God being in control of all things. And though the people of that day that Paul was pastoring and speaking to may be going, how could this possibly be, how could he possibly be sovereign when we're being killed? We look back later and we read the Bible because again, we have a big picture view of it. And we know that through that time, God used it to use for his purposes of spreading the gospel throughout the world. They couldn't see it then but you can see it now, and you've benefited from it because you have faith in Christ. You know Jesus because of this. The the sovereignty of God in the establishment of government and governmental authority is clearly biblical. And additionally, you know, as, as we see here from this, this verse, you know, the Bible teaches submission to the government authority to the extent that anyone who disobeys or rebels against the government is actually disobeying and rebelling against what God has ordained, with the only exception being that if the government orders you to sin or to compromise your loyalty to Christ, where there actually is example of righteous civil disobedience in the scripture. Acts chapter 5 verse 29, when Peter and the apostles were being ordered to stop preaching in the name of Christ, Peter says in that moment, in that case, we must obey God rather than men. So, so that's, that is a place where it, it has taken place, but that's, that's it. Now hear me on this, okay? Our responsibility to honor and submit to the government of our country is not dependent upon whether or not we voted for the leaders or even like the leaders. It's simply an institution that's been created by God, and it's God's will that we obey authority. Also hear this, neither does this truth mean that God approves of all that human rulers do. I mean, He certainly doesn't approve of corruption and brutality and oppression. In fact, we know from the scriptures that human rulers will be judged by God, and, and all the more harshly, as James says in James 3.1, that the, there, is, there is judgment. So, you know, that, something I mentioned earlier is uh, that I want to come back to is the, the, this fact that divine sovereignty and human authority, uh, human responsibility, divine sovereignty and human responsibility somehow mysteriously coordinate with one another. And, and we see in the Bible not only examples of God choosing leaders and God raising up people and putting them into power and then God using that to accomplish His purpose, we also see in the Bible people choosing leaders. Deuteronomy 1.13, Moses said to the people, choose for your tribes wise, understanding, and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. These are human people, right? So they, they're, being, they're being given the responsibility to choose from among them people that they think are wise and able to lead them. And also in Exodus 18, 21, Jethro counseled Moses, and he said, moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, 
and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And so you kind of see the establishment of some, some government here, right? People who are, are in charge of the, the whole, the, you know, a bunch of people, and then just this, this area territory, and this territory, and that territory, and then just this tribe. And you see that, the, that those who have been given the authority to make those choices are human beings. And so it's not that those who teach and, and believe and trust in and understand the truth of the, the, the fact that God is sovereign don't, don't, you know, it's not that, that those people think and assume that, that human beings are just puppets, that God is just, 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 just moving us around and we have no responsibility in the matter. You know, even John Calvin once commented on those verses here in light of political elections, and he said this, Hereby it is shown to us that when we have to elect men to hold public office, we must choose them with discretion and not take on the fly those who thrust themselves in first. Neither must they be taken for favor or for some vanity that appears good, but that God presides over the election and that such men may be selected as are known to be appropriate to exercise the estate to which they are called." Another of the reformers who was a reformed preacher um, and preached on the sovereignty of God, Charles Spurgeon, is quoted as saying this in context of voting for candidates. He says, let us, whenever we shall have the opportunity of using the right of voting, use it as in the sight of Almighty God, knowing that for everything we shall be brought into account. And for that amongst the rest, seeing that we are entrusted with it, and that if at the next election we should choose wrong governors, or we shall, then we shall have nobody to blame but ourselves, however wrongly they may afterwards act, unless we exercise all prudence and prayer to Almighty God to direct our hearts to a right choice in this matter. And so it's clear to me, it's clear that there is indeed human responsibility in elections. And, and, and as Christians, we have to take prayer, you know, clo- very careful attention and prayerfully reflect on the choices that we have to make during elections. However, once the outcome has been determined, we must submit ourselves to the government that results from our votes, even if it's contrary to the choice that we made because the sovereignty of God is what determines the outcome of a national election. Yes, I believe that. I know this isn't easy. It's not an easy thing to grasp I under, I, by any means. I understand that. P- presidential elections, if they do anything at all for us, if, the, if, it's, if this is done, if you could see any good in what's taking place here, it's done a lot to assist us in identifying these two biblical truths that when put together are incredibly mysterious. It's incredibly mysterious how, because they appear to be contradictory. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility. Both are true. God is sovereign and man is free to choose its leaders through elections. However, the outcome of the election works together to fulfill the purpose and will of God in his creation. It's all true. And listen, because of that, I can't overemphasize, I, can't, I just can't emphasize enough how vital it is, it is for us to be praying, praying, praying for our national leaders, for those who are in authority. But some people might, maybe even right now, you're thinking, well, if God's sovereign, then what's the point of praying, right? He's going to do what he wills regardless, so what, what, what's, what, you know, but listen, I, I rebuke that argument and say this, if God is not sovereign, then there's no point in praying because he wouldn't be able to answer most of the prayers you pray. I mean, who wants to pray to a God that's not sovereign? Think about it. You ask God for something, you might be asking him for something that he goes, I don't have any control over that. Because some people believe God doesn't have any control over this or this. He sits back and he allows us to make our own choices. So why on earth would you pray then? What do you pray? You're praying to someone who has no control over the matter? The very fact that he is sovereign is what gives prayer its power. And because we know that that men and women in the world do have responsibility in the choices that are made that bring about his sovereign plan, then prayer is most definitely not only relevant, but it is imperative that we do it. Listen, if this message is anything for you at all this morning, my prayer has been that it just, it reminds us that 
how we live every day in relation to the government and to our neighbors and our friends and our enemies is to be is to be shaped and mold, you know to be to be you know influenced and shaped not by not by the prospect of Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or Gary Johnson or anyone else being the president of the United States but by the inescapable reality that Jesus has authority over them and over us. That's what your daily life is to be shaped by. That's the best thing that I can give you in this. No Democratic Party, no Republican Party, no Libertarian Party, no Green Party, or any other political party is savior of a nation. And regardless of who is elected president here in the next two and a half weeks or in any future elections, God remains sovereign. So, (laughs) in two and a half weeks, you'll head to the polling place. What will you do? Right? Because that question's still there, I'm sure. I'm not answering that for you, am I? Well, you're going to stand there. You're going to look, right? And, you know, and, and although there are some outliers and write-in possibilities, right, essentially and unfortunately, there are, there are two main candidates running for office. And only one of them is going to win. And none of the candidates, none of them, carry a true Christian message or fully embrace a biblical Christian values that you embrace. And you know what? That's normal when it comes to president, you know, to secular events like national elections. We shouldn't expect anything different. It's not ever been different. We've not, I mean, it, there, if there ever is, if there ever by the, any possible chance, small and minute chance, that a Christian candidate that holds the same values that the Bible upholds does run in some way, they get shouted down or marginalized early on in the primary, or they never actually make it very far in the process. And you know what? I wouldn't expect anything else in a paganized country where the centrality of Christ is a thing to be mocked rather than something to be exalted. Things haven't changed that much. You know, if, if Christ were running for office in his day, I'm sure that the powers that be in the first century WikiLeaks would be working overtime, and they would have doubled down to make sure that he wasn't put in political power. In fact, the reason they killed him is that very reason. They thought that he was politically getting too popular, and they was going to create an army that was going to overtake. That's one of the reasons why he died. Outside the sovereign will of God, and we shouldn't be shocked by any, we, anything that, listen, anything that goes on, if you're shocked, don't be shocked. I mean, you know, in most cases in our national elections, we're left with candidates who either just totally reject God or just marginally acknowledge God because it's going to, you know, serve their own purpose and gain. And it appears that this is, that's just, that's where we're at again. It's nothing different. And one of the things we have to remember, church, brothers, sisters in Christ, is that political power has nothing whatsoever to do with spiritual power. Nothing. Do a quick study of the priorities of the church in the New Testament, and you'll find absolutely no mandate to press the government for legislation on moral issues. None. You'll find, in fact, what you'll see is that the maneuvering for political influence is one of the very strategies that Jesus named as worldly methods and something that ought not characterize the leadership of his kingdom. Christ said that his kingdom is permanently set apart from every other earthly dominion, and the reason why is because his kingdom is not advanced by the kind of political strategies that depend on the implementation of human authority, but his kingdom is advanced by humble service of his people. And that's the kingdom that you're a citizen in, you who are a believer in Jesus. Don't forget that as you're lobbying for one or another or whatever. In my opinion, there isn't anything that's happened in this past half century that has done more damage to the mission of the kingdom of God than the notion that the best way for Christians to influence society is by exerting our collective political influence. If you, if you think that the most important answer to the evils of our society is a legislative solution 
Or if you imagine that political activism is the most effective way for the church to influence culture, or if you suppose that the church is going to, to win the world for Christ by lobbying in the halls of Congress or rallying Christians to vote for this or that type of candidate or legislation, then both your trust and your priorities are misplaced. The tendency to seek legislative solutions for every social problem is one of the absolute worst tendencies of contemporary secular society, and it's extremely disturbing when we see Christians more or less follow that same exact pattern. The only power that can truly and permanently rescue human society from its own evils is the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. And that only happens through the regeneration of an individual human heart, not through electing political candidates. So what this means to me then is that we need to be putting less energy into debating people about who they should be voting for and more energy into evangelizing people to the the gospel of Christ. That's the only power you have to create change in this world. That is the power you have to create change. Preach the word in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching, 2 Timothy 4, 2 says. Preaching, not lobbying, is how we're supposed to make the truth known. Gospel, the, the gospel, the good news, not law, is what changes human hearts. Service, serving, not power, is the most effective way to win people in any culture. And Christ, not moralism, is the primary substance of our message. In, uh, I want to show you... One more section of Scripture here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul does something in this chapter that is, I think, very relevant. He contrasts the biblical strategy for how to change the world with every other kind of strategy in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and especially the kinds of strategies that try to win people by impressing them or entertaining them or seeking to gain their respect or admiration. And the biblical strategy is really plain and simple and straightforward. You simply proclaim the truth as clearly as possible and you call people to repentance. That's the biblical strategy for changing the world. Everything else, Paul says, everything else is wasted effort. It's even, it's even counterproductive. And, 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 I'm, and listen to how he outlines this. It's uh, verses 2 through 5 in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now listen so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And then he says in verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now the, the Apostle Paul was proclaiming a truth here that is incompatible with the political machine in this world. And he said it as emphatically as he possibly could. Likewise, my preaching here this morning, or any morning really, is is not an attempt to comfort you with good moral advice. That's not what we do. It's not what we're here to do. It's not what we've been called to do. Those words, the the, the words of the wisdom of men, does nothing to strengthen your faith. It does nothing. The the only only the power of God through the, the constant reminder of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what has power to strengthen your faith and to comfort you in the troubled time that we find ourselves thrust into politically. There is no true comfort in the wisdom of men. 
And so I'm convinced that the best possible thing that I can do in helping you, our church, through this election process is to preach the gospel, the gospel of God and his sovereignty. Our our theological perspective, what we believe about God is, is always going to, you know, and how he relates to government, it's always going to agree and yield to the truth of his supreme sovereignty as creator of the universe. He is the sole owner of creation, and we are residents in his kingdom. And as a good and sovereign God who owns all of the, the entirety of, his, his, of, of eternity, he is from the smallest of creatures to the, to the largest of his creatures. He is worthy of supreme love and glory and honor in all that we do. And any time that we don't accomplish this first and greatest commandment that we've been given, what we do is we place our own importance above the importance of God the Creator. Now, what, how is this relevant? <laughs> how does this apply to the election of a president? Think of this as you consider your vote. Think of this. Our right to vote may be considered a mundane right, but it is, like anything else, a privilege from the sovereign God. And considering that we have been granted this privilege, what are we we do with it? Do you use it to advance your own interests? A, a, A biblical perspective would suggest that your vote, just as in everything, should everything you do should be used to glorify God. Now, I don't mean that the candidate that you select should be the one most capable of glorifying God. That may never be the case. But what I mean is that the motivation that you have, the motivation of selecting a candidate should be made from a, 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 a man or a woman who loves God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And from that absolute and God-centered love, you then subsequently love your neighbor as yourself. And if your vote is for selfish reasons, or reasons that elevate creation or creature over the Creator, then it is, by, it is not, by definition, bringing glory to God, but rather glory to yourself first. So the question you have to ask yourself as you prayerfully consider your vote is this. Do I believe a vote for any of the presidential candidates can satisfy the requirement to love God and neighbor absolutely? That's what I'm wrestling with. And that's all I have to say. That's all I can give you. Let me say one more thing. Where's the band at? You guys, come on back. This is an important point I think that I I, I shouldn't fail to give. There have been times God's plan may at times include ungodly leaders. You know, something that you that you may be wrestling with is, is why God allows certain leaders to rise to power. Leaders that have unbiblical goals, or even leaders who are completely against God or motivated by evil rather than by good. And, and again, in our limited understanding, we don't have all the answers. We, you might not see the big picture, but the Bible does assure us that God has a plan and a purpose for all things. Ephesians 1.11, remember we quoted that earlier? In Him we have, have, obtain, have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his pur- the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. There, you know, and there are examples of, of this, you know, as, as I mentioned, throughout the Old Testament. You know, and other examples, Isaiah 45, 1 and, you know, through 3, where you see, you know, about Cyrus, the pagan Persian king that God appointed to, uh, and, he, and God had granted him great power. And oddly enough, God moved Cyrus to free the Jews from captivity in Babylon and even financed their efforts to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. You see that in Second Chronicles. And, and, and another example, this is probably the most astonishing example, if you really think about it, is, is in John 19, 11, Jesus is standing before Pilate on trial, and he says to Pilate, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. 
So here is Jesus, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God and creator of the world. Now think about what he just said. He affirmed that he is under the authority of a secular, godless, political figure. You would have no authority over me, he says, unless it had been granted to you from above. He's affirming that. And he also affirms that Pilate had been granted and appointed his position according to God's sovereign plan. And even more scandalously, God had granted this ungodly leader the authority to order the beating and the crucifixion of his only son. Now step back for a minute from that story, right? Step back for a minute. It, 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 this, devast, this devastating scenario in the political world of Jerusalem and in Rome at that time would make no sense to us from a human standpoint. In fact, it didn't make any sense, did it, to the disciples? They were scared out of their minds when they saw Jesus arrested. They, 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 these guys who had actually walked with Jesus and heard him teach, they were frightened. They didn't know what was going on. How on earth could this be God's plan, right? God allowed this event, and what happened was it fell in line with His perfect will and eternal plan. And it's through Jesus' death on that Roman cross just outside the city walls of Jerusalem that we have received the greatest gift ever given to the human race. Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Let's pray. And God, we need you. More than ever, we need you. Forgive us for our lack of faith. It's very possible that many of us over the past several months or weeks or days have fallen into the trap of acting just like the world, speaking just like the world, looking at the political landscape and, and finding ourselves in conversations that disparage another person. creations of you that you've made, people. Lord, may our influence, may our testimony, may our, our witness be one that is God-centered, Christ-exalting, saturated through the Scripture. May that be what we stand on, not what is happening around us, not what Twitter says or what what this commentator says or that news outlet says or, or this particular group or this particular cause. We get so distracted. And what are we distracted from? We're distracted from the incredible, eternal, supreme God of the universe who is sovereign in control of my life, in control of all of this. May our focus and our worship be solely on you. May we respond now, Lord, in these time, this time to come in our service, the next half hour as we sing. May we respond in however you need us to respond. So Holy Spirit, come and work in Jesus' name. Amen. I love when I hear 